We were talking about vehicle impact protection as part of the overall process and mentioned that there's no specifics provided in the residential code about that. The ICC actually has responded to this particular issue in other arena and this particular situation is showing furnaces and water heaters and the like being protected from vehicle impact and they're talking about a wheel barrier or a parking curb another term for it, or a bollard. And so you can see the bollard, which would be set in concrete or some type of an anchor. And so they show some anchoring details and stuff like that. Now this is just providing information. This is coming from the International Code Council as commentary for how you might protect something, an appliance from vehicle impact. And certainly these would be fine methods. You say appliance too. They got furnaces and water heaters. Right. And those are, you're concerned about running into them, not because you're worried about damaging the appliance. That's one thing. You're worried about the fact that it's a combustion appliance that could be a gas leak that could be very dangerous. If it was your washing machine, who cares? There's no requirement in the code to protect your car from your washing machine. And as you notice, there's these dotted lines running vertically on this diagram and that's to show the sidewalls and saying that something if it's something that's within the sidewalls then bollard protection or wheel barrier protection would be unnecessary that's essentially what they're trying to say there that it's optional so that's some good information that was used in developing some language for the 2024 irc and so we're just going to say right here too when it says 2019 cfc that or crc that's the same as the 2018 residential code and building code that's right. In 2021, in July 2021, the California Residential Code is going to adopt the changes that were made in the 2021 Residential Code. California is probably going to be one of the first, if not the first, set of jurisdictions that actually apply these new rules. However, there's going to be quite a few other states that follow fairly closely behind in just the general adoption of the 2021 IRC. The 2021 IRC may not have even been put out on the website yet, and so it's in publishing at the moment, and we have a little bit of visibility into what it is because I was involved in development of some of these requirements along with a lot of other folks. And so the term stationary storage batteries has been change to energy storage systems and actually energy storage systems should be underlined in that case because that would be new language. The term has been changed to match the National Electrical Code and the exceptions have changed. Basically there's an exception to following any of the rules here in the IRC if the ESS is listed and labeled in accordance with UL 9540 and marked for use in residential dwelling units. This is this new standard that is yet to have a lot of meat in it yet and there are no products on the market that meet this requirement now, this is a very special set of requirements basically this is a battery that's a benign battery proved to never be able to catch on fire or made it so difficult that it was considered a safe appliance no different than your washing machine or certainly no more hazardous than your stove or oven or anything like that that can start fire okay it has to be installed according to the manufacturer's instructions, as we saw earlier, and the NEC, which is NFPA 70. We also have that one kilowatt hour maximum, which was also in the 2018 IRC as an exception. Now, the installation locations in the past code cycle, it said that it can't be installed in habitable rooms. And so that would keep it utility rooms, garages, hallways, would include bathrooms, which was never really intended. So they decided to get a lot more specific about where. And so locations has become more specific. This is all new language. It shall only be installed in the following locations, detached garages or detached accessory structures. So you could build a shed for a battery as an accessory structure. A detached garage is an accessory structure that's designed for cars. Number two, attached garages separated from the dwelling unit living space in accordance with section R302.6. That's the requirements for sheetrock that are required to be between the living space and a garage. So you need some sheetrock in there. That's right. right. Gypsum is the term that's used in the code. Number three is outdoors on the exterior side of exterior walls located a minimum of three feet from doors and windows directly entering the dwelling unit. That last little phrase there is to basically make it clear that if you're on the outside of an attached garage, 
and you're near a window going into the garage, that's fine. You don't have to stay three feet away from that window or the garage door, for instance, or the side door to the garage. You can go right up to the edge of that opening. However, if you're putting your ESS on the outside of a house that's near a bedroom window, you'd have to be three feet from a bedroom window or three feet from your front or back doors, things like that. Okay, it's allowed to be installed in enclosed utility closets, basements, storage or utility spaces within the dwelling unit with finished or non-combustible walls or ceilings. So it could be basement that has block walls. Okay, it's non-combustible. Now the ceiling would also have to be non-combustible, which would either be sheetrock, finished, you could have finished ceiling. Walls and ceilings of unfinished wood frame construction shall be provided with five inch type X gypsum. That's special, better grade fire protection gypsum board. Sheetrock is the term that's often used, but gypsum is the standard term. ESS shall not be installed in sleeping rooms or closets or spaces opening directly into sleeping rooms. So if you have a nice walk-in closet in off your master bedroom and it's got plenty of space for an energy storage system, not allowed because that opens into the bedroom. So these are the only places inside a home and that's really long drawn out explanation of what they meant by not installing in habitable spaces <laughs> is what it is. And then giving some specifics about when you're in that non-habitable space, basement, utility room, or whatever, that it has to be finished construction, or if it's unfinished construction, it has to be covered. So for instance, let's say a lot of basements don't have sheetrock on the ceiling going into the house. This would require 5 8 type X gypsum to be on the ceiling of that basement in order to meet this requirement. And this is new in the 2021 IRC. Now we have stipulations on the maximum ratings of these energy storage systems. So the units themselves can't be any larger than 20 kilowatt hours. So that's a limit for something going in under the IRC. Can't be any larger than 20 kilowatt hours. And then you can have multiple units, but the aggregate of those units can't be any larger than 40 kilowatt kilowatt hours within closets, basements, and storage utility areas, or 80 kilowatt hours in attached detached garages or detached accessory structures, or on exterior walls, or outdoor on the ground. So that puts an upper limit on the amount of energy storage you could place in one of those areas. So does that mean like somebody that's got like a huge house can't put more than 80 kilowatt hours on it? That's a really good question. And the answer is maybe. <laughs> like if they put it out way out in the yard or in a bunker. The way I read this is that you could put 40 in the house, you could put 80 in the garage, you could put 80 on one side of an exterior wall, you could put 80 on another exterior wall, and you could put 80 on another exterior wall, and then you could put another 80 on the ground. Because I would think like if you had like a five acre place, you know, yeah. that you should be able to put, you know, as much as you want. Now, uh, the last yeah. item, number four, says that we can exceed the permitted individual or aggregate ratings installed in accordance with if we follow section 1206.1 through 1206.9 of the International Fire Code. So that would be the more likely place that you would go is to say, okay, I'm going to actually put in a commercial size battery system. I'm going to follow the fire code in that case. Hmm. The residential code is really intended to address smaller typical applications, not ginormous mansions. So we really don't care about rich people, mm -hmm. quite frankly, in the IRC. You know, they have their own problems, but they're mostly emotional problems and not mm -hmm. financial problems. So financial problems are solved by lots of money and engineers, whereas emotional problems have, you have to go to therapy for. Yeah, and then they can just <clears throat> write checks to politicians and do whatever they want. Exactly. So from this perspective, I could see a situation where I could walk into a jurisdiction and get 250 kilowatt hours installed on it uh, because I would basically follow all these rules and put them on different places, maybe even higher, and that should cover it for most mansions. I'll remember that when I get really rich. That's right. Cash in your Bitcoin. Okay, fire detection. This is a new section. It was not in the code before about fire detection. It says rooms and areas within dwelling units, basements, attached garages in which the ESS are installed shall be protected by smoke alarms in accordance with R3. 14. And then this has been the problematic language since everybody's been focused on this for the last year or so since it went into proposals for the IRC. A heat detector and it says listed and interconnected to the smoke alarms shall be installed in locations 
within dwelling units and attached garages where smoke alarms cannot be installed based on their listings. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that you cannot install a smoke alarm in a garage because the temperatures in a garage go above and below the maximum and minimum values that a smoke detector is allowed to be installed in. Okay, because of that, there are other devices and something called a heat detector or heat alarm is something that may have a larger temperature range than a smoke alarm. All right. Unfortunately, they put the language that it had to be listed and interconnected with the smoke alarms of the house into the IRC. So that's language that's in the 2021 IRC. The reason we have it crossed out and highlighted here is that it's been removed from the California code reference. So there was a proposal put in and accepted to remove from the 2021 IRC this information or mm -hmm. CRC, the California residential code, because that particular set of requirements it essentially impossible to apply because there are no listed products available right now that are listed and able to be interconnected with any smoke alarm system that's available for residential right now. Now that's changing and products are coming available, but until that happens, this is a very problematic sentence. It was something the fire service wanted to have. It was kind of a horse trading deal done in the code process and everybody's trying to work together to figure out ways around it because it's a bit of a mess. All right, so here we did some reorganization with the numbering from the 2018 to the 2021. So now what was R327.6 is now 327.8 for protection from impact. Again, we changed it to ESS instead of stationary storage battery systems, but it doesn't change the requirement. If it's installed in a location with subject to physical damage, vehicle damage, that it shall be protected by approved barriers. Again, the term approved means that the local jurisdiction has to approve it. So we could come up with an idea idea that does protect from vehicle damage and if the local jurisdiction doesn't buy it they don't like it okay i can put up a little sign that says stop that can be my barrier protection it's a it's a sign that tells me not to go there that's a barrier but it's not a local jurisdiction could say well that doesn't stop the car that just tells the person to stop and so they may not approve that now i can put up a wheel barrier as we saw previously and most jurisdictions will accept that but there's probably some jurisdictions out there that when they think of a barrier they think of a bollard and they believe that that's the only method okay since it doesn't say they can come up with whatever method they think is appropriate so what the the installer has to do is propose a method that they think the local jurisdiction would approve and then see what happens. It seems to me just like don't put it where your car is going to bump into it in the front of the car. Correct. So that's, that's probably the easiest. That's easiest. But unfortunately, that's not always possible. We can sit here and talk about it and say, oh, well, you should just do that. And in most cases, intelligent people would do that. But there are many times where I've found that I go to all the lengths to try to put it in the places that would save me the most hassle and it doesn't work. So I've got to put it in a place that is going to create some hassle. So that's why we need more definition on that section. And then ventilation is the same information, but it just says that it's, it, we added the word mechanical, but M1307 mm -hmm. requires mechanical ventilation anyway. Okay. Electric vehicle use. This is a fun one. This was added, of course, because it's underlined. And it says the temporary use of an owner or occupant's electric power vehicle to power a dwelling unit while parked in an attached or detached garage or outside shall comply with the vehicle manufacturer's instructions and NFPA 70. You don't want to go against the vehicle manufacturer's instructions. You don't want to go against the electrical code. This seems like money. This seems like apple pie motherhood. It's a great statement. Mm -hmm. The original statement that was proposed by the fire service to put in here was absolutely ridiculous. Basically said, if a car is going to be parked in a garage for more than 30 days, that somehow there would be stipulation. It would prevent the car from being parked in the space for more than 30 days. And they had all these silly things mm -hmm. that went around that. It was just ill-conceived. And so we ended up with this better conceived language, which is simply that if you're going to use your electric vehicle to power your house, follow the rules and follow the code. And we have a whole section in Article 625, which has the names been changed from electric vehicle charging stations to to transfer equipment energy transfer equipment to electric vehicles so it's absolutely intended for this very purpose 
So mm -hmm. there is direct language in the electrical code to transfer electricity to and from an electric vehicle. And so that is in NFPA 70. And then the manufacturer, as those products become available, which they're not right now, as vehicle manufacturers start to make that an available option on their vehicles, then they will have instructions on how to use that equipment. Yep, right now it'll void your warranty. Reminder, 2019 CRC is the 2018 IRC. And so 2018 IRC is the version that implemented the requirement for UL 9540. And UL 9540 currently doesn't have any products other than lithium ion. So all your products are gonna be lithium ion batteries. And so that's a little over restrictive, but rather than trying to change it in the residential code, that's being changed in the UL standard. And so that's being worked on right now to make it easier for lead acid systems to be used and be applied based on UL 9540. And lead acid batteries are gonna be superior to lithium ion for standby backup service application. Standalone applications, they certainly could have all historically always been used for standalone applications. Lithium ion is going to be okay for standalone applications as well, but backup for what we call standby power where the batteries are kept full all the time, lead acid is better and we'll have some products probably available in the next couple of years. The fact that it has to be in non-habitable spaces or not allowed to be installed in habitable spaces would restrict it to utility rooms, garages, hallways, but it would also include bathrooms as well, which is kind of weird. That's why we put the question marks on that. Uh, normally we're talking about utility rooms, garages, attached garages or storage rooms that don't enter into a bedroom or something like that.